All right, we have four presenters. The first one is Giovanni Lonetta, an undergraduate. Uh, Giovanni, start. Uh, don't forget to introduce yourself, okay? So <clears throat> here, let me just share my screen real quick and get my presentation up. Okay, so, so hi everyone. My name is Giovanni Lunetta. I'm an undergraduate here at UConn and I'm going to be presenting on the data cleaning process, which is usually the first step of dealing with uh, a data science project. So uh, in the presentation, we'll explore the New York City 311 request data, and we're going to clean it up for a further analysis. And I'm going to transition back and forth from the presentation to my code and just to get a better understanding of what I'm actually doing. And so the outline of this, um, I'm going to have an intro, do some data cleaning, do some exploratory data analysis, talk about geocoding, and then conclude. So uh, the introduction is, uh, so the data ranges from January 15th, 2023, up until January 22nd. So this is just one week's worth of data. So this is a very small subset of this data, but it still provides us with a lot of information. And it includes all the 311 requests within this given uh, time frame. And due to like human input error, the data may look very messy, making it almost impossible to perform any sort of analysis. So therefore we have to clean the data. Um, so to start, we're just gonna import uh, the pandas library, which is a library that is um, that helps us visualize data better. And you don't really have to worry too much about the code specifically, but I just wanted to put it here so that you can see it. Um, and the first step of cleaning uh, data is almost always looking at the first few rows and columns of the data set. So we're going to jump over now to my code so that you guys can um, better see this. So here, like I said, we import the, um, the CSV file, which is a file that has all the information. And when we look at this data set right off the bat, there's a few things that I want um, people to look at. So the first thing is I want um, to look at the difference between agency and agency name. And then as we go through this data set, um, look at all these null values that we see, which are just where people don't input data. So like imagine if you're um, filling out like a Google form or something and you just leave something blank, that's where that's what would lead to a null value. Or, and then also look at things such as like latitude, longitude, and location. And so just looking at this right off the bat, we can see that there's a possibility that agency and agency name might be the same thing. So we can actually run a piece of code to go to check these. So we can look at the first 20 call of rows of this data. And we see that, that the agency and the agency name are the same thing, which makes sense. Agency is just the abbreviated version. So essentially when we look at data sets like this, we want to see if the columns are actually all providing information that can help us with our analysis. So, in this sense, agency name doesn't really provide any more information than agency does because it's essentially the same thing. And we also see this with longitude and latitude and the location uh, column. Location is just the combination of longitude and latitude. And then thirdly, if we go back up here, actually, we see that unique key is really just when someone creates that um, that ticket or that that complaint, the 311 request, it's just the unique key that is there. So even that doesn't really provide us any information. So the first thing that I did after looking at this is I actually dropped these columns because they're not actually providing us any information, any more information to help with our, with our analysis later on. Uh, another big problem and probably the biggest problem when cleaning data is dealing with these missing values, as I was mentioning before. So we could actually run code to look at the percent of missing values in, the, in us, every column. And as we see, there's a lot of columns that have over 99% of the total columns all missing. So depending on how much time you have and what the actual missing values are, there's different things that you can do. But for the time constraints that we had to deal with, being that this was a midterm project, I actually ended up just dropping these columns. So all the columns that had more than 99%, I think it was 98% um, missing values, we I just dropped. So Another good uh, pra good practice is to check the, the descriptive statistics, which is like the mean, the mean, the standard deviation, the max, the min of the continuous um, variables. So we see here that we have the zip code of where the 311 request was um, taking place. The this is just like a address, basically. Um, the so yeah, so these are 
Um, here, sorry. This is... Um, yeah. So when we look at these things, we could actually see right off the bat that there is a zip code of um ten thousand or one zero 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 zero, and upon further analysis, just looking it up online, this is not a New York zip code, and we actually can see how many times this comes up, and twenty three times there's a zip code an input of a zip code of this. So what I did here is I removed um, those those uh, instances. So there's also more tedious problems. These are more, make sense more visually because you can actually see exactly what these problems are. But then there's also, you have to get into the individual unique values of different columns. So we can do this for, let's say the descriptor column, which gives us the um, the description of what the request, the um, 31 request was. So we can see there's there's 613 unique values of in this in this uh, column. And for sake of not showing you all 613 of them, one of the problems that um, came up with with this this column and a, a also location type was that there were null values, but there were also different instances of other. So imagine you're filling out a form of some sort and you click on the other option and then it tells you to fill out what the other option is. So this there was a problem where things like other explained below, other complaint uh, details, these were all different instances. And so in order to uh, fix this problem, again, don't really worry too much about the code itself. But what I did is I changed all of these instances to just other and also filled all the null values with other in order to clean that these columns. So we did a similar thing with address type and park facility name where the null values are essentially the same thing as something being unrecognized or unspecified. So in order to deal with these null values, I just replace them with their respective unrecognized or unspecified as we see here and here. Um, and so all these steps, like this could, the, the more time you have, the more you could really dive deep into these specific columns and all this data. Um, another, another thing I wanna look at briefly is Another problem that doesn't always seem like it would make much sense is the fact that uppercase, lowercase, and spaces are all very important. So as we can see in the city um, column, we have a problem where queens and queens are two different cases. They're two unique values, where queens has a capital Q in one case and where it is all lowercase in another. So something that um, is, is, is important is to either make all of the string values, so all the text values in a data set, make them all lowercase or make them all uppercase and also removing these spaces in between. Because imagine you're typing something in, you accidentally type two spaces instead of one or add a space at the end of a word. All of these are little problems that you wouldn't recognize until you have to deal with the problems while you're doing a data analysis. Um, so here now we can see that the missing value counts are a lot lower than they were before. And there's also less columns because we removed so many. And um, another important, uh, now, now into more of a data um, analysis, kind of exploratory analysis thing. Um, another thing that we can look at is what's, what are the, what does, um, what do the dates look like? So we have, we have columns like resolution, action, update date, and we also have created and closed date. And we see that, these are just inputted as a date and then the time. But to a computer, they can't really understand this as a, as a date in a sense that we would understand it as a human. So what we can do is Pandas, this library on in Python, actually has a way to create, create it, to, imp, to put it in a way that is better understood by the computer. So we can do this by running just this code. Obviously, again, don't worry too much about the code. And a problem that we could figure out now after doing this is we could figure out is, is there any instances where close date is after or before create a date? So we can actually run a script and tells us there are instances where close date is earlier than create a date. And we can actually see these instances where the close date is 116 and the, the created date is 117. Obviously this doesn't make any sense because how can you how can you close a request before opening it? It makes sense or it doesn't make sense. So what we do is this actually happens 134 times. And we can actually drop these cases. Um the next thing that I want to talk about is geocoding. So let me go back now to my slides. So 
what is geocoding? So geocoding itself is converting addresses to geogra ge geographic coordinates. So if you have an address, you can pull the um, the zip code, the latitude, longitude, all these different things from that address. Reverse geocoding is doing the opposite. If I have your street name, if I have your zip code, if I have your longitude and latitude, I can now geocode that, that address in. And another thing, something that we can do what, with geocoding is that we could actually, based on the zip code, we can actually take information and get more information such as the population, population density, housing units, all these different uh, more variables that could help us with our analysis. And another thing that we could actually do is we could visualize. So this is all of these requests and you could actually, they're clustered, but when you get, when you look at this interactive map, you can actually see specifically where all these are taking place, which is pretty, pretty cool to see visually. And it makes an, uh, analyzing all this much easier and not necessarily simpler, but being able to see this very specific to on the map makes the coding process a little easier. Um, so after that, um, let me go to the next slide now. So these were just the initial slips, uh, steps to clean the data. And I want to mention some um, suggestions to the curator. So obviously, as mentioned before, I mentioned a lot of these before, things like agency name and location don't really need to be um, in, the, in the data frame if we have things like agency and latitude and longitude. Also question how it's possible for closed date to be earlier than created date. And if I were dealing with this problem, I would make sure that when they input the the close date that it's always after the created date. And if they try to submit it where the close date is after the created date, then it wouldn't let you submit the form. A couple more um, is, as I mentioned, with the other and, uh, and unspecified, keep them consistent because other and unspecified or whatever whatever the, the terminology they want to use, keeping it consistent helps it easier to actually deal with this data. And that actually leads right into my fourth suggestion, which is if you have different forms of other, make them consistent and also don't let someone input nothing. Make sure that something is inputted. And then finally, the last thing is to make sure everything is either all uppercase, all lowercase, and to not have to deal with the problem of different characters. So yeah, that is the presentation on data cleaning. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, I think we are on a tight schedule. Maybe we, we should let this uh, go on to the next speaker and then we can uh, answer all the panel, panelists can answer questions at the end. Uh, Shivering, you wanna start? Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shivram. I'm a senior uh, undergraduate student at UConn. Um, and I will be continuing uh, to use the 311 request uh, data set uh, to perform some additional analysis regarding the duration of, of each request uh, from when it was from when it was created and to when it was closed. Uh, so here's an outline for the presentation. We're just going to discuss the data set real quick and then we'll dive into some questions that we want to tackle. Uh, which involves some visualization and some analysis, and we can wrap things up. So I think Giovanni kind of summed it all up in terms of the uh, you know, necessary steps we need to take to, to clean up the data. Um, and, and the data that we're working with is, is, is a subset of the uh, overall data set uh, 301 services requests from 2010 to the present. Um, so this is over a, a period of a week. Uh, and I will be restricting my analysis to uh, the request where the agency is NYPD. And these four uh, variables are the ones that I will use from uh, the original data set uh, for my analysis. So to prepare uh, the data, uh, as Giovanni said, you know, there are a lot of missing values that occur in the data set um, for this uh, analysis, uh, the primary ones were making sure that uh, the borough uh, was filled in properly. Uh, for the most part, I think it, it was, there were some uh, values which were listed as unspecified. So we needed to use the US zip code uh, package uh, to, to geocode or um, take the location uh, or latitude, longitude to uh, find a zip code. And from the zip code, we could determine the uh, correct borough that uh, the request originated from. And uh, on the same note, we used created date and closed date 
converted them to date time objects um, and created a new variable uh, duration, uh, which was the uh, difference between closed date and created date in hours. Um, in addition, we also created a variable uh, called day type, um, which has the values of a weekday or weekend based on which day of the week it was according to created date. Um, and so here are the, here's the data set that we use for the analysis, but uh, with the added uh, two variables of duration and data. Okay, so here are the questions that we are interested in asking regarding the data. Um, is the duration of a 311 request to the NYPD related to the day of the week that the request was made, such as whether it was made on a, a weekday or weekend, or if it was related to the borough that the request was made in? So looking at uh, the day type or, or weekday and weekends, um, we can visualize the data usually using a few different methods, but I chose to visualize it using um, a violin plot and a histogram. So the violin plot is very helpful for us to understand the density of the requests based on the duration in hours uh, for both weekdays and weekends. Um, and uh, this is all done through plot nine, which uses ggplot from R. Um, so here's the histogram. And these are two separate histograms. Uh, as you can see, the weekday data it's there's significantly more weekday data compared to weekend data, um, but they generally have the same shape and uh, they're both heavily uh, skewed to the right. Um, so in these cases, as the histogram showed, the, um, the duration times and their distributions for both weekday and weekend are, are skewed to the right and they have similar shapes um, because we know that these are not normal uh, distributions, uh, we can use a non-parametric method uh, that, uh, that will be used to compare the differences between these two independent groups. Um, and in this case, we'll use a Mann-Whitney U-test uh, from the scipy.stats package. And uh, here are the summary statistics for uh, both weekday and weekend, both uh, categories of the day type variable that we create. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there's uh, more than double uh, the amount of weekend data uh, for weekday. Um, but the we can have an imbalance, we can work with imbalanced data in this case uh, in uh, using Mann-Whitney. So for this, uh, we use the Mann-Whitney test and the hypotheses are that, uh, well, the denial hypothesis is that uh, the duration for weekday and weekend uh, will be the same. Uh, and the alternative hypothesis is that that they will be different. Um, at this point, uh, we have to uh, use a two-sided test as opposed to a one-sided test uh, because that would require a bit more uh, investigation into the uh, into the um, to trends that would make make that so uh, so that we're not possibly excluding any sort of um, uh, movement. Uh, so, using the uh, scipy.stats package, we uh, can input our data as arrays uh, for both weekdays and weekends. Um, and it returns a, a p-value of a 0 0.02, uh, which using the alpha level of 0 0.05, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the distributions for the duration of weekday and weekend are different. Now comparing uh, durations across boroughs, um, we can once again visualize them in a similar fashion using a violin plot uh, to, uh, you know, to depict the density of each uh, borough uh, and the duration of requests. Um, in this case, the histogram is also very helpful as we can recognize that the shapes of, of each distribution for each borough are, are generally the same, although they may differ in, in uh, the size of, of the data available to us. Um, and in this case, just like with day type, uh, the distributions are heavily skewed to the right. Um, they do have a similar shape, but since there are more than two independent groups, uh, we will use another non-parametric method uh, to compare differences. And that will be the Kruskal-Wallis test, 
also through the SciPy stats pack. So we use this to compare the distributions for uh, duration for each borough. Um, and the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis are, are generally the same. Um, and we, uh, for the Crystal Wallace test, we can return a p value of 0, 0.0, which is not the actual p value, but uh, it, it just indicates that the value is small enough that uh, uh, that it's not uh, a recognizable value uh, according to the uh, program. But uh, with this value, we can reject the null hypothesis with an alpha level of 0 0.05 uh, and conclude that the distributions for each borough are different. Um, and in this case, because we have a p-value of 0, 0.0, um, I mean, it can be said that due to the large uh, size of the data set, I, even with all the uh, filtering uh, that we've done, considering that we're only dealing with uh, New York Police Department requests, uh, as well as any sort of other data cleaning we did, um, the dimensions of the data set are still around 21,000 uh, rows. Um, so uh, that could definitely have an impact on how uh, the uh, distributions of each group uh, are compared within the data set. Um, and so for this reason, uh, we can attempt to gain more insight into the differences between the distributions uh, by um, conducting a post hoc test, uh, which will be performed using the scikit post hoc package. And so in this case, uh, Dunn's post hoc test is uh, is the post is a a test that we can use, uh, which is appropriate to conduct after a crystal Wallace test returns a uh, a p value which will reject the null hypothesis. Um, and in this case, we'll also use a Bonferroni correction on the p value itself. Uh, in order to account for any um, type one error or family wise error. Um, and in this case, the hypotheses uh, will apply to each individual comparison between uh, boroughs. Uh, and the null hypothesis is that the distributions for duration for borough I and borough J are the same, whereas the alternative is that they are different. Um, and we can conduct the post hoc uh, test on the data set as is, um, and we have the return p values here. Um, and I specified the condition uh, that it would return true if, if the value is less than 0 0.05, which is our alpha level. So we can see um, which uh, combinations of boroughs uh, return a p value, which is statistically significant, and, and that we can determine that the difference exist between the distributions of birth, both boroughs um, that is significant. Um, and for all cases, except for Brooklyn and Staten Island, um, that was the case that the differences that existed in the distributions uh, between boroughs was significant, um, except for Brooklyn and Staten Island. So in this presentation, uh, we quickly uh, analyze the duration of 311 requests to the New York Sorry, was I muted? I just might. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I just wanted to say that, yeah, we, we uh, analyzed the duration of 311 requests to the NYPD over the course of, of a week's worth of data. Um, we conducted uh, non-parametric tests to compare the distributions of duration uh, for weekdays and weekends and for each borough. Um, and we used uh, two different uh, methods, uh, the Man Whitney U and the Crystal Wallace test. Um, and they returned, uh, their, their results indicated that there is a significant difference between um, the uh, duration times for both weekday and weekends, as well as for boroughs, except for uh, Brooklyn and Staten Island. Um, in the future, I, I think it would be interesting for uh, to test whether uh, both day type and borough uh, could be used as predictors in a multiple regression model to predict duration. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shivarin. And to the audience, if you have questions, please type it up in the chat window. We will address them later. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Caitlin. Caitlin did some analysis to predict well, what are the factors um, that um, uh, uh, contribute to those uh, requests that take longer than three hours to, to um, close? 
All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Medard. Um, I'm an undergraduate student here at UConn. Let me share my screen real quick. So like we mentioned, I'm going to be talking about modeling and predicting specifically if a request, if its duration is over three hours in length. So just as an outline, first, I'm going to be talking about the data, the training, testing, and validation sets. Then I'm going to move on and talk about model training. In this presentation, I chose a decision tree as the model of choice. Then I'm going to be talking about results, both for validation sets and pre um, test sets. And finally, I'm just going to make some concluding remarks. So our training data, uh, like Giovanni and Shivram mentioned, takes place from January 15th, 2020, uh, January 15th to January 22nd of 2023. Again, I'm only working with requests specifically made to NYPD. So first step we had to make was to add, um, create some variables duration, which allows us to define our over three hours variable. So essentially if the, the duration of the request is over three, hours in length, over three hours is going to be coded as true and false otherwise. I also did a similar process to define the weekday variable, which would be like the day type variable in the previous presentation. This is true if it if the request occurred on a weekday and false otherwise. Um, I also created a variable uh, hour of the day, which represents which hour of the day the request occurred zero to 23. And you can see here um, the created variables. So I also wanted to include some zip code based information in, in my model. Namely, I would I was interested in determining if population density, home value, and income had any sort of effect on whether or not a request was over three hours. So I used the US zip code database um, Python library to merge on a zip code level with our data set. And you can see here, this is our data set. And at the end, I have appended the population density, home value, and income information. So now we needed to make these same adjustments to our testing data. So I, of course, just added in all of the variables that I did to the testing data. Our testing data is the week of the following week of our training data. So January 22nd to the 28th. And we're going to see if this or how our model performs on the testing data in the upcoming slides. So just to summarize the parameters that I'm going to include in my model to predict whether or not the request is over three hours in duration. I'm going to choose the borough, whether or not is a weekday or a weekend, which hour of the day the request occurred, the population density of the zip code in which the request occurred, the average home value of the zip code in which the request occurred, and as well as the average income of the zip code. So before we can begin our model training, we have to transform our categorical variables into dummy variables. You can see here that our categorical variables are going to be borough, weekday, and hour of day. So this code just um, computes the dummy variables using pd.getDummies. That's just some code that you can look at. And you can see here now our data frame contains encoded dummy variables for each borough as well as weekday, weekend, and then you can see it gets cut off, but you can see each hour of day is encoded as a dummy variable as well. So now we're going to fit the model now that our data um, has been split into training, testing, validation, and we've accounted for dummy variables. So I chose to do a decision tree. There's other options that I know could be used, such as logistic regression or random forest, but this is just the route that I went. First, I'm going to perform a five-fold five cross-validation search in order to find the most best suited 
um, parameters for our model. This is the code that I used here. These are our different tuning parameters. And this just runs the cross-validation search on our training data. And we found here that these are the best parameters for cross-validation. And we just have 100, um, roughly 1,400 nodes in our tree. So I first validated the results on, I believe I chose a 30%, 70 to 30 ratio of the training data. So for the 30% validation test uh, set, um, we have pretty decent results. We have here, you can see about an 84% accuracy and an AUC area under the curve score of 63% which this essentially means that our um, model is performing better than a random guess would be. Like if you were to flip a coin, it's performing better than this. You can see that these are the number of true positives, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives. However, unfortunately, when I went to test it on the, the January 22nd to 28th, um, set, we found worse results. This could be due to multiple different reasons, which I'll touch on later on. But you can see here, we have an area under the curve score of 0.53, which essentially means that our model is performing slightly, very slightly better than if you were to flip a coin. So I just wanted to visualize some of the results. Um, this is the feature importance scores of our training data. You can see here that these five particular variables seem to have the greatest effect on our model. Um, and those are zip home value, zip income, population density, and the boroughs, Bronx, and Queens. So these, these feature importance can indicate some things about our model and what how they affect um, the duration, whether or not it's over three hours. For instance, population density, more populated areas might indicate that MIPD is going to respond quicker. Similarly, if we have a higher home value and higher income in the zip code in which the request occurred, um, it implies that more costly, wealthier zip code areas might see higher, quicker response times by NYPD. And finally, if your request is made in the Bronx or Queens, you might experience longer durations in having your request fulfilled. However, since our model isn't entirely um, accurate, it would require more statistical inferences and testing to be able to make these assumptions with full confidence. But these are just some interesting observations that I made. All right, so in conclusion, um, our decision tree might be seeing some poor accuracy due to model simplicity. Uh, I believe that duration, whether or not it's over three hours, might be more complex than uh, the parameters I chose allowed it to be. And then there's also some decision tree instabilities with numerical values that could contribute to the low accuracy on predicting the following week of the um, data. But then I just wanted to summarize that we still found some interesting insights about important features that may predict or um, affect whether or not the duration is over three hours. And those are namely the income and the home value, as well as population density and which borough your request occurred in. So that is all I have for you guys today. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Again, if you have questions, please type it up in the chat box. Our last pre presenter is uh, uh, Stephanie Shen. The last question for, for the midterm project was an open question. I just said, now you know the data better and come up with a question that can be answered by the data. Let's see what Stephanie can tell us. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tong. I'm you can call me Stephanie. I'm a third year PhD student uh, in the Department of Human Development and Family Sciences. Um, today I'm going 
to present the last part of our midterm project, which is the open question. And uh, <clears throat> my question of interest is how to find a neighbor-friendly area in IC. Maybe someday we can provide suggestions to our friends based on this information. So um, here is the outline of my uh, presentation. I will begin with introducing the data um, and the packages um, that used to answer this question. Then um, I will answer this question uh, through uh, three different perspectives. The first perspective is checking the total compliance distribution. The second one is the, uh, exploring certain complaint type, such as noise and uh, illegal parking. And the third pr perspective is uh, uh, exploring potential influential factors, such as distance to the NIPD and the median home value. These three perspectives um, are based on a common assumption that more complaints suggesting a less neighbor-friendly environment. Finally, I will sum up the findings and discuss some other ways to answer this question. Um, I hope that at the end of this presentation, you will have a basic idea about so what inter interesting things uh, we can do uh, with the open data and some Python tools. And don't worry about the codes, they will be made publicly available and uh, you can easily examine how they work. Um, by the way, uh, chat GPT is the go to to explain the meaning of the course. Okay, <laughs> let's get started. Um, these are the Python packages needed. The most important one is GeoPandas, um, which is a powerful tool for working with the um, geospatial data. It, uh, it can analyze uh, and uh, visualize local based information. Um, I mainly use the four data sets. The first data is NYC merge data. It combined the two data sets. One is a cleaned version of 311 requests that were received by, by the NYPD between January 15 and January 21, 21st. The other is uh, obtained from the US zip code package, which is contains information like media home value and the population density per zip code. The NYC merge data is cleaned and merged by Yang Kang. Uh, the other three data sets I use uh, contain location-based information, specifically uh, spatial information about New York borough boundary, New York zip code boundary data, and uh, NYPD location. Here are the codes uh, of the, how to load the data. So now let's explore with this data and packages. To begin with, let's get a basic idea of complete complaint distribution. We can plot the location of complaints reported in different boroughs. This will help us identify areas with a high volume of complaints and any pattern or trends that may be specific to certain boroughs. We can do this by creating a map with different boroughs drawn in different colors and using smaller markers to represent individual complaints. From the following, uh, from this map, we can say that Staten Island has the latest complaint density um, here. Okay. So um, while Staten Island may have a much lower complaint density than other borough, it may have certain disadvantages, such as limited transportation options. For example, um, computing from Staten Island. Oh, let me change it here. Okay. Um, for example, computing from State Island to Manhattan may be time consuming and uh, inconvenient for those who need to work in Manhattan. Therefore, we continue to explore the complaint density in different zip codes. So this is the interactive map and it shows general complaints per zip code. Um, so by moving the mouse over the map, you can check the total complaints in that zip code area. For example, here, like there are more than 400 complaints. Remember this is in one week. So based on this interactive map, um, it would be advisable to avoid this dark uh, red uh, areas in Brooklyn, um, Queens and the Bronx. The Brooklyn, yeah, Queens, Bronx. So while we have explored some general neighbor friendly areas by analyzing the total number of complaints, um, it's important to 
consider specific needs of individuals. For instance, um, if your friends are sensitive to noise and prefer a quiet uh, environment, or if they drive and dislike areas with high incidence of in illegal parking, we need to take those specific needs into account. Um, based on the noise complaint map, it is recommended to consider state island, uh, of course, excluding the northeast area um, and uh, most areas in Queens. Um, uh, and, and the most uh, areas in Queens are like uh, uh, advisable, uh, except uh, for the Western area. So for those who prefer a quieter location but want to live in Manhattan, east side, like east side, my um, upper east side um, might be a good choice. So um, here is the map showing illegal parking. Uh, complaints. This map shows the Staten Island and most area in Queens are also good choices for people who need to drive and dislike illegal parking. In addition, or interestingly, like Manhattan has relatively low number of illegal parking complaints. I don't know, I think it might be due to there are many NYPD in the in the Manhattan. So now let um we have found some larger areas that we want, might want to suggest based on different needs, such as Dayton Island and Upper East uh, side, uh, side. Um, or most areas in Queens. You may still want more specific suggestions for a good place to live. For example, you may be wondering if it is a good idea to live near NYPD, as this could potentially reduce noise and illegal activities in the area, maybe. Uh, or you may be curious if higher house value co 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 correlates with uh, having more friendly neighbors. Let's take a look. Uh, so here's the map showing the total complaints per zip code and the location of NYPD. The small blue dot represent NYPD. From the map, uh, it is not easy to tell if there is any relationship. Um, to investigate whether living near an IPD impacts the number of complaints, I create a histogram of the distance between the complaint location and the nearest police station, like here. So uh, from this histogram, the suggestion is don't, don't, like don't specifically look for houses or apartments that near an IPD, like it's very high here. Um, now let's say, uh, do we need to pay more for a more friendly neighborhood? Uh, from the map, we can see that Manhattan and Western Brooklyn have the highest median home value. However, from our earlier uh, exploration, we found that these areas also have high total complaints and high noise complaints. So it's not necessarily true that higher house prices correlated with more friendly neighbors. So like here are the suggestions. Um, so it's not necessarily true that high, uh, um, but but it's not necessarily true that they have uh, correlations. But uh, it's possible that um, house prices within a borough may moderate the relationship between complaints and house values. So to explore this possibility, we can look at a scatter plot of complaints uh, counts against the median house values for each borough. So here is the schedule plot. Based on this um, plot, um, there does seem to be a clear correlation between the number of complaints and the house prices. So this suggests that higher house prices may not necessarily lead to more friendly neighbor. In conclusion, uh, analyzing complaint data can provide valuable insights for people looking to find a good place to live. Um, by plotting complaint locations on map, we can ad identify areas with higher complaint surveillance and the specific patterns or trends that may be unique to certain boroughs or neighborhoods. Um, from the maps and the analysis presented, we have identified some general areas that might be friendlier for different needs, such as Staten Island for those who are sensitive to noise or need to drive or the Upper East Side for those who want a quieter location in Manhattan. 
However, when it comes to specific questions such as whether living near NYPD or paying higher uh, house prices correlates with more friendly neighbors, the data does not provide clear evidence of any correlation. Um, we can also use this method to further explore this question. For example, we can use other NYC open data such as 911 calls and NYPD arrest the data to see the security of or safety of an area. Or if your friend just uh, care about the noise during the night, night, you can specifically check that. Or you can check things like trash and the property maintenance. All in all, like there are many possibilities to explore this NYC open data. I hope you have fun with it. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I think now we are getting to the fun part, most fun part of this presentation questions. Yes, um, so I've done some documentation. I've done some documentation on uh, some of the questions we got in. Uh, would you like me to first mention the speaker and then the question that they got? Yes, please. For sure. So for Giovanni, um, there was a comment that came in as to whether the close date being less than the created date, um, whether those were entries from the Department of Transportation um, that was the question. So where we where, where, where you found that discrepancy, whether those were complaints for the Department of Transportation, and if so, that it might not be an error, and possibly um, how they they've come in from the API. So I actually didn't. <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't actually check that, but I could definitely, I could definitely check that and see if there's a correlation between those two. So I don't have the right answer, but it's definitely something that I could look into no problem and um there was some questions about the interactive geocoded map um was it generated by python yeah so it's generated in the in the ide so like i put the map on the slides but that that interactive map is actually in in my in my code so you could you can use scroll in and out and look at the individual um instances in python yeah excellent and that that'll be accessible uh as part of a package that everyone can get access to, right? Uh, yes, GitHub? Correct. Okay, excellent. And um, moving on from what I saw, Shivaram has a question from Zuyan. I'm um, just a minor comment that if the P value that you were mentioning is extremely small, uh, Zuyan um, mentions that oftentimes you're using um, P is less than 0 0.001 in conclusion, rather than the p-value being 0.0. .0. Um, so that's a comment. And I can also just paste it in as a quote, just for your reference, Shivaro. And you might have seen this earlier as you were presenting. Um, otherwise, nothing much else. But for Caitlin, um, we have a question from Vera. The zip code house value uh, Oh, this one was, uh, I think, was answered in the chat. Um, I think from June that this uh, the census data that came along with the zip code information, it was part of the same package, right? Is that correct? Yeah, those uh, the U.S. zip code package contains data originally from the U.S. census. Got it. Tom mentions to Caitlin um, <clears throat> that he is not familiar with the decision tree analysis. How is it better to answer your questions than linear models? Also, have you considered potential, potential collinearity between factors such as income and house values? And how could this affect your analysis? Yeah, so a linear approach such as logistic regression was another approach that you could take. Um, I chose decision trees because often they're considered more easily interpreted. Um, logistic regression would give us like a single barrier between to differentiate over three hours versus under three hours, whereas a decision tree separates the decision into different subparts. So that is essentially my approach there. Um, I didn't actually consider any collinearity factors, but that is definitely a good suggestion. And I can look into that to see if that um, improves my prediction at all. So thank you for that comment. 
Great. And I'm just going to take a second before I move on to Stephanie. Um, what I saw here is that, um, oh, from Zachary mentioning that if anyone is interested in learning more about the Ruan One and how it's captured, um, there will be office hours dedicated to the team that's uh, running 311 um, on Wednesday. The link is in the chat, so you could join in and ask some more questions for clarification. Um, so looking forward to have you there. And um, so for Stephanie, um, Zunyan also mentioned for your presentation whether the complaint density was um, that was calculated was based on population size or the physical area of each region. Yeah, that's the uh, like per zip code, like based on the area that represent the, that specific uh, zip code. Okay. So the complaint density calculated was based on population size or the, or the physical area? You said it was based on the zip code, meaning physical area of the? Area, yeah. Oh, the physical area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will also go ahead and drop in another link, similar. There are many more events throughout the week still uh, to be had. Feel free to have check them out, register. If you um, haven't been aware of like open data week, or maybe you're, this is your first session. Um, so there's many more events and definitely want to make sure you all are aware. Um, any other questions while, while we're still here? Um, I wrote down what I saw so far, but maybe there's some more that has come up. All right. Not hearing much, but um, to all of the presenters, uh, the crowd is very receptive to your presentations. Uh, lots of praise, lauding you for your work. Thank you, B. Thank you, David and Cynthia. Um, all saying great presentations. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, the, all the presenters. Thank you for breaking away from your break, sacrificing your spring break time. Nice work, guys. Definitely. All right. And um, Professor, um, all of the um, information with links to the code uh, that was used for presentation will be uh, coming through email. Should people expect that there? Yes, we will post them on our uh, uh, class notes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Very well. At least public. Well, if there's not much else, um, I think we can close out. I think we're just a bit over, but thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for joining us for today's session. Thank you. Data thank Science you. with UConn at Open Data. And yeah, hope to see you at more events. Take care. Yeah, thank you.